Okay, thanks very much. Uh, as, as Jerome says, uh, we have a very interesting keynote speaking today. Um, as they say in Vueling, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Julia Rodriguez. She's the chief scientific officer of the company Sikai. Uh, she will tell us a lot more about it than I can improvise. Uh, Julia has a background in, in science, so she, she's by training, she studied biology. Uh, has a PhD in biomedical sciences, working on diabetes research at Hospital Clinic. Uh, worked for some time as a postdoc at ABEC, also at the, the Institute for Biomedical Engineering in, of Catalonia. And she will tell us, in fact, a bit her trajectory, okay, as a, from a personal point of view, but also the trajectory of how, uh, how a company is made, how a company evolves, how you make something successful, which, which is something amazing because if you follow LinkedIn and, and these things, they, they get a prize kind of every week. It's, it's, it's really cool. So with a further ado, please. Thank you, Miguel Angel. Uh, you did a spoiler of my talk. Um, thank you. Uh, well, today, uh, of course, I'm going to explain you a little bit this journey from academia because I have a pretty basic uh, academic um, background to entrepreneurship as a co-founder of, of Sikai Medical. Um, as Miguel Angel said, I am a biologist. I did the bachelor's degree in uh, biology in Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, and then I did a master's in physiology. In 2012, uh, there was the crisis, so um, I had no opportunity to get involved for doing research uh, after this, uh, the Master um, of Science. So, because I am a person that I like many things, um, I decided to take the Master Teacher Education um, in order to have uh, or to become a teacher in life sciences. Two months after starting the Master, a PhD came to me. Uh, my uh, principal investigator called me from EDVAPS to start a PhD. So it was during two years of my life, I was parallelizing the master in teacher education and the, and the PhD. So it was a very stressful um, time lapse in, in my life. However, in 2016, I finished the master's in teaching education, and I, I thought maybe I have too much time and then I uh, started a master's in criminalistics. So you can see that I have many interests in my life. Um, and finally, at uh, 2019, I finished my PhD thesis in molecular biology. I was studying diabetes, uh, the molecular mechanisms underlying the, patho the pathology of diabetes. And then I started the postdoctoral research at IBEC. Uh, Institute for Bioengineering in, of Catalonia. I, I passed from studying mice and cells to more applied research. I was developing what is called an organ on a chip. In my case, I was developing the pancreas on a chip in order to try and test different drugs uh, in a physiological environment. And as I like to parallelize things, in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, I co-founded Sikai Medical, uh, and I am currently the chief scientific officer of the company. So uh, I'm here today just uh, to explain you a little bit the opportunity that you have as a, as a scientific st student or engineering students to become an entrepreneur. But in my, in my, um, in my life, when I, I finished my, my PhD even, I even didn't know what a startup was. So um, the first question is, what's a startup? And what differentiates a startup from a small business? So when a startup is a company that is usually um, in the early stages of, a, of course, of a company, this is also on a small business, could be, could be this, um, this uh, um, company. Uh, but the, dif the main differences between a small company and a startup is the business model. And the startup typically have a disruptive business model seeking to change the status quo. And of course, the startup uh, thinks in uh, big. The startups, the startup uh, have a very great potential, have an innovation and creativity, and also uh, it has the scalability, meaning that we are um, trying to achieve 
the whole wall. We are trying to reach the wall with our products. And of course, the, the mindset of an entrepreneur is the exit strategy. And a startup wants to be sold in the next few years or wants to go public through an IPO. This differentiates from a small business. For example, a sushi making restaurant. This is a small business. It's making sushi to um, get or to satisfy the needs of the neighborhood. It can escalate a little bit. You can just um, do another restaurant. OK. Why this is not a startup? It doesn't have this business model that is disrupting. It doesn't have this scalability. It doesn't have the exit strategy. Um, however, if you are developing a technology, trying to change the sushi making process and trying to sell this technology to restaurants that are making sushi, this could be a startup. And this, then you can think big. So what's the uh, objective of a startup? The first objective is to go fast. So you need to iterate in every cycle um, that you are. The first cycle of a startup is the discovering cycle. You need to validate the problem solution, and you need to validate the proposal that you are um, giving, the, the solution that you are um, constructing to tackle the need. Then you need to validate. It's very, it's very nice to have a, pro, a, a product that is solving a huge problem and it has a huge potential of growing. However, there's someone willing to pay for it. If there is no willingness to pay, then you can stop doing this product. You can iterate and, and do another product. And you need to validate the isolated model. So the entrepreneurship is a journey that requires an, an initial decision on whether to create this small business or to create this startup with this uh, exit strategy. And finally, escalate is the third phase of a startup. You need to demonstrate scalability potential. You need to validate the growing engine of the, of the company, and you, you need to scale as fast as possible. And for a technological and scientific um, company, you don't, uh, you, you don't need to forget the technical and clinical feasibility, which is very, very important and very difficult to achieve. So um, how we validate the problem need? We, need, we conduct market research. We, do, uh, we identify pain points of our customers. We identify pay points of the target audience. And we uh, calculate the magnitude of the problem. If the problem is small, then your startup is not going to grow. It's not going to achieve this, uh, it's not going to change this business model around the world. Then you need to develop an MVP, a minimal, minimum viable pro, uh, product, as fast as possible. And you need to validate the MVP with your clients. You need to collect this feedback from these early adopters. There are always early adopters. There's uh, these people that are more innovative than others. This, these people that at the beginning were the ones uh, buying an iPod from Apple, for example to ensure that your uh, problem is really tackling uh, the need. The product is tackling the need. Then you go to the market fit phase, implementing this pricing strategy. Sometimes when you develop something new, you even don't know how much it costs. It's the example of Sikai Medical. We don't know uh, how much a software for a medical imaging is worth how much the hospital can pay for a software that doesn't exist nowadays. So you need to just uh, implement a pricing strategy and try to go to customers and, and see if they are willing to pay for it. Then uh, you need to ensure the business model, which is also something that is difficult to, to get. How is the hospital paying for a software? Is it pay for use? It's a license, it's an annual license, it, it, it's just a product that you sell and it's, uh, it's 
then it goes to the hospital uh, for the entire life. This is something that you need to think and you need to validate with customers. And then you need to test also the distribution channels. How are you going to sell the product? Are you going to go directly to hospital? Hey, I have a software, do you want it? Or are you going to use uh, local distribution distributors that have the network already established? This is something that you need to validate. And these are some questions that you need to, to ask and get answers. What problem are you trying to solve? How big is the problem? How would this make people's lives better? Who are the co competitors? What's the business model? Something that I already explained to you. And at this stage, you need to talk to as many people as possible. And this is something that I, uh, from my point of view as a researcher, at the beginning was afraid. How a big, uh, oh, a very important person are going, is going to talk to me. Then uh, you realize that people is willing to talk to everyone to discuss a business model because people want to know what is going new. So at the, uh, in Sikai, we started um, talking to everyone. We were in the middle of the pandemic and uh, doc medical doctors were very open to discuss things through uh, Teams or through Google Meet, something that before didn't happen. So we took, we took advantage of that. Then you need to plan and focus on taking your learnings and create an executable plan. What does the product will look like at launch? How will you get customers? Uh, where is the break-even point? How much cost and time uh, will get you to, to get the break-even point of the company. And this is very difficult to establish for a medical device company. I will explain you later. What partnerships you need, what advisors you may need, what's the team you need to develop it. So um, I'm gonna just explain you several activities or several experiments that big startups have done to demonstrate this uh, product market fit, that people is willing to pay for a specific product. One example is the landing page. It, this experiment is just creating a website, um, it's, or creating a, a landing page that describes your product. And the objective is to get the interest of people and customers, or you get email of customers. This is, this is what Zappos did at the beginning. Zappos, uh, which is a company that is selling shoes, at the beginning was taking pictures of shoes uh, of stores around the neighborhood. And uh, the founder put the photos, uploaded the photos on a landing page. And he realized that people were trying to, to buy those shoes. Then the founder went and bought the, the shoes from the store and um, shipped the shoes to the customer. So like this, the founder could validate that people was, were willing to buy shoes through internet. At the beginning, people went to the, the, the store, but now we are all buying shoes through internet. So this is something that Zappos did at the beginning with no stock, upfront stock. He was just putting the shoes, you want the shoes, I go, I buy the shoes, and I, I ship the shoes to you. Other um, examples or other experiments you can do is the smoke test. The smoke test is like the landing page. But you, uh, you for example, you can um, record a video explaining what a product is doing. However, there is a uh, little difference. When you're trying to click and buy the solution, then a message comes out and says, oh, we are out of order, out of stock, or something like this. This is not true, you don't have that stock. It's not existing, the product. So you are not uh, even developing the product, but you are validating that people are willing to pay for it. And this is what Dropbox did at the beginning. Dropbox was, um, was just, at the beginning, a company that uh, was uh, founded to share content through devices. And they realized that people wanted that. They even didn't um, develop anything before uh, doing this smoke test. The other thing is the prototype, the MVP. This is something that WhatsApp did. 
at the beginning, WhatsApp validated. He, they, they develop a very um, simple uh, platform, a very simple um, application where users could share the status. And they realized that people were willing to share their status. So after that, WhatsApp became what is now. But they validated at the beginning through a very simple um, prototype. And then another experiment is just doing interviews. This is something that Sikai Medical, as a big company, very famous company, did. Uh, we conducted one-to-one uh, -one, uh, interviews through internet with medical doctors, with radiologists, with uh, stakeholders of the sector, with um, many people um, working with medical imaging at the end, or paying for medical imaging. So we could get these uh, insights from the very beginning. And the third phase is the scalability. This is the growth and expansion phase of a startup, and you need to uh, assess the potential to scale operations to increase demand without compromising your product uh, quality. You need to also um, identify and optimize the diverse customer acquisition. Uh, retention of customer is not the same that the customer is buying your product once, that the customer is buying the product once and again and again. Um, you uh, need then to scale rapidly, secure funding. You may need a, a funding round to get money, especially if it's a medical device company, uh, because you cannot sell the product until you get certified. Um, and you need to uh, have the strategy to go to new markets um, fast. And that's the typical uh, startup curve. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the idea. Then uh, the prototype, this is what is called the Death Valley. You can be here many, many years. You then go to the break-even point. This is when um, you go to stability in terms of economics. And then starts growing until expansion and maturity of the product. Well, we founded Sikai Medical at 2020. It's almost four years now and we are still here. So um, believe me, uh, when you start a company, don't think that it's super easy, that you will get rich. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, and especially if you are developing uh, something related to health. So uh, then it's the why of moving from academia to entrepreneurship. Of course, everyone can have uh, different um, different ways. Myself, uh, it was about to have this desire of, for impact. Um, the motivation behind the move uh, in, in my case was that I, I felt that I was doing research to write scientific papers that at the end nobody cares, right? Um, that you are developing a project because you have a grant that is paying for that project. The project finishes and nobody cares. And this is something that I really didn't like. This is, I really, really liked doing research. I, I, I felt myself that I was uh, discovering things and that I was publishing things that really interest me. But I felt myself with this sensation every time. Then when I moved to IBEC, I was doing more applied research, and that, that was something that I really liked a lot. I was developing this organ on a chip, something that you can sell to pharmaceutical companies to, te to test drugs that, at the end, will impact on human health. Um, and finally, of course, founding Sikai, I really feel that I can change something, and, and then I can impact uh, people, people's lives. Um, there are some financial uh, incentives. What I was saying, if you are developing a medical device company, um, think, don't think in big at the beginning. You will probably um, will be without a salary in the first uh, year or more, uh, because you need to get funding from venture capital investors. You cannot sell the product, so and you don't have money at the beginning, so 
uh, it's a compromise. Um, it's very difficult this, these early stages. However, of course, if your startup is successful and you get an exit, you can you can have or you can have this financial incentive and become rich. Why not? Then there's this frustration with academic bureaucracy. This is something that we were discussing at the beginning. In, in academia, uh, there's uh, this burden of bureaucracy, paperwork uh, before starting a project. In a startup, it's more dynamic. You start uh, working at the very beginning with anything, uh, with any break. Um, so um, this is something completely different. And then the, there's this autonomy and flexibility. Um, I would say that both ways are hard and difficult, but when you found a startup, you can have your own um, schedule, you can have your own, I would say, work-life balance. This is not really true, but um, at the end, is not um, something very strict as, as may ha be in the university or in a research um, center. And here uh, I wanted to explain you the main differences that I, I found between academia and entrepreneurship. Something that you need to change and for me was not easy, it was not a straightforward. Because during eight years I was a basic scientist following the rules, following the scientific method, having an objective, an hypothesis, then validating the hypothesis, having results, publishing, publishing the results. So in, in, a, in a startup, you need to change the mindset. Uh, you need to, to think that you are developing a product that people um, are willing to pay for it. You are not doing research trying to understand things. So you need to go fast, you need to go quick, and sometimes the product is not perfect. This is something that for a scientist is difficult to understand. And what uh, Ray Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, uh, said by starting a company is like jumping off a cliff and assembling the plane while you are on the way down. You may crash, but you may not. <laughs> Um, of course, there's different risk tolerance when you found a startup or in academic uh, career. Um, in academic career, it's hard uh, to, to establish a secure position, but you can get it. You can have your uh, own, you can become a principal investigator and, and, and have your own group. In entrepreneurship, um, this uh, is not is not the same. Uh, the risk of failure is super high, and um, well, many stri startups we are trying to survive um, in, in the very beginning of, of our life. Potential rewards, as I was uh, commenting before, in an academic career is inner end of the research you want to publish. This is something uh, that is rewarding. Um, you are discovering things. I. I I remember um, fin finalizing the day that I discovered something in the lab and I was super excited. So um, for me, that was rewarding. Uh, in entrepreneurship, the rewarding uh, stuff could be more related with this direct impact on the society. And of course, the potential, and I say potential, financial uh, reward if you, have, if you are success. Work environment is not the same. As, as I was saying, in, in academia, it's highly structured. You have a principal investigator that, I, uh, that is supervising your work, and you are doing your uh, experiments um, in a long-term focused manner. And startups, we operate in a more dynamic uh, way, sometimes um, with totally uncert uncertainty. Re support and resources in academia is easy. You have libraries, you have your uh, principal investigator helping you. Um, you, have, uh, real, um, you have support everywhere in a startup. Um, you, don't, you don't know anything and you don't um, have anything. That's why it's very important to have mentors, to have uh, an, a team that can help 
uh, operate this. Funding is also different. In academia, as you may know, uh, primarily go comes from uh, these governmental uh, agencies. And in startups, uh, funding comes from venture capitals. This, is, this means that someone is giving you money to get an exit after uh, several years and to get a 5, 10 per uh, reward in this money back. So these venture capitals are going to press pressure you at the end. Also, when I was in academia, I was writing grants to get money. In a startup, you need to pitch to investors. This is something that when you, when you are in, at the university, nobody explains you how to do it. But you need to um, develop a pitch deck. You need to make this pitch deck explaining what are you going to do. And you need to convince these venture capitals, because probably you don't have nothing. Sometimes you go with a PowerPoint and a video to a venture capital to get half million euros. Now, this is something that you need to learn how to do it. And it's not the same doing research than developing a product. What I was saying before, you don't need to have the perfect product. This product will iterate and will uh, become um, better, but it's not going to be perfect anyway. In research, this is not something that is accepted. But I think that as, as uh, science uh, scientists, we have several skills that help, help us um, founding a company. For instance, we have these research skills. We are organized people, rigorous people, trying to uh, benefit with this problem solving uh, in business. This is like the scientific method. We have a problem, we question it, we do an hypothesis, and then we experiment and we get data. We, we have this critical thinking as well. We are uh, able to discuss science. We are able to uh, extract conclusions. And this is the same in, in business. And we have also this project management during uh, our thesis or during our projects because we need to establish deadlines and, um, and, uh, and at the end, get conclusions to do these projects. And it's the same for, for uh, business projects. However, what, is, uh, what lacks as a scientist is this business uh, strategy, the mindset of a business man or a business woman. So I recommend you to get education and training. You don't need to, to do an MBA. You don't need to do a business course. But I really mm -hmm. recommend to get involved in entrepreneurship boot camps. What are these boot camps? These boot camps are boot camps that um, help you doing the pitch deck, uh, doing the business uh, model, also um, doing the storytelling to investors, to the users, helping you to do the, the interviews I was uh, talking about. And how to find these boot camps? They are everywhere. You have Barcelona Activa next to us. In Barcelona Activa, there is the pre-incubation um, startup program. You present an idea. You don't need to constitute the company, but you present an idea with a team or alone. I recommend you with a team. And uh, you go through this pre-accelerator program. They help you uh, to develop, really, these, uh, these projects. But you not only have Barcelona Activa, you have a EAT Health, you have Techno Campus in Mataró, you have uh, Connector, uh, many, many, many programs that will help you. And you will get this networking uh, involved, and you will get the mentorship within these bootcamps. And uh, well, that's something that when you create a startup, you need to, to, to be aware. It's not just having an idea. It's not just building a prototype. But you need to have knowledge in engineering, business, legal, and regulatory requirements, especially with products, medical products. And of course, this is uh, the reality. You start the company. 
Mm, with this initial enthusiasm, uh, we have hype. Why we are go going to do something that is fantastic. Then comes the reality, and uh, you start uh, being down. Uh, and it, I would say at the very beginning, uh, because sometimes you need to experiment this pivoting because uh, you start with an idea, you realize that customers um, are not willing to pay for it, or this idea is not tackling any pro real problem. So you, we exp you experiment this pivoting, you start working, we are still here. Finally, you get this product market fit, and then you scale, but this could take a long time. But what makes a successful startup? According to uh, a study, these are the four main uh, points that makes a successful startup. The first one, of course, is a strong product. With a product without a product, you are not going to do anything. Then is a well-researched go-to-market strategy. This is something that uh, for us was difficult at the beginning. Um, a strong organizational culture. And I would say that for me, the most important part is the team. We, uh, we got funded in 2021, uh, 2022, sorry, two years after the, uh, starting the company. We had an MVP and investors invested money on us because of the team. We are three co-founders with three very complementary roles and also we have very young people, talented people that we are getting from universities working with us. And I would say that this is super important because uh, the day that I am down, my colleagues are up and vice versa. If you are alone, this would, will be hard. And what makes a startup fail? Because also according to a study, 90% of startups fail. This is a huge number, but you want to be this 10%, right? So the first uh, thing, 42% of startups fail because lack of this product market fit. Then almost a 30% of startups fail because uh, they are running out of cash. It's simple. If you don't have money, you cannot develop the product. Third problem is team problems. You need to be uh, very aware of with whom you are co-founding a company. And then the, the fourth thing is not adapting to change. Sometimes we think about our baby, we think about, oh, we have developed this, uh, and no, I think that this is a very uh, good idea. Don't stick to the first idea. Iterate if you don't see this product market fit. However, despite facing this potential business fa failure, 84% of founders were willing to form another startup that company after the first failure. So just keep trying. Once you have founded one startup, you have learned many things, <coughs> then apply this to, to other, other companies. And these are founder recommendations according to a survey uh, of uh, 150 startup founders last year. Um, recommendations for preventing startup failure. First, have, having a stronger business plan. It's difficult to, to, have, to, to, the, to make an, a business plan because you are planning um, how much uh, sales are going to have, how it's worth your product based on nothing. Um, then you need more financial um, backing or investors. From the very beginning, you need to start talking to investors. Then uh, better marketing, more research prior to launch having a co-founder or partner, and also, uh, of course, a better product. And so why? Why did you, why uh, did us uh, founded Sikai Medical? Well, Sikai Medical is the only AI-driven medical device algorithm for screening that anticipates cancer in the abdomen, non-invasively. Why we developed that? Well, this, these are some, some figures of incidents of, of cancer worldwide. Um, and we can see that these figures are worse every year and they are expected to increase in 2040. And specifically for pancreas, liver and kidney that are localized in the upper abdomen of our body, 
these figures are um, uh, worse and are among the deadliest cancers worldwide. These three cancers are, are expected to be three of the fastest growing cancers in the next 20 years. And if we focus on pancreatic cancer, this is the first product that Sikai developed. Pancreatic cancer has the lowest survival rate. In fact, if you are diagnosed today of pancreatic cancer, you will have less than five months of life expectancy. And these figures have not improved in the last 30 years. We can see that this is the five-year survival rate, meaning that five years after the diagnosis, how many people is alive? 9% of people diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And this 9% is almost maintained during the last 30 years. Why these bad numbers? The first one is because there is a lack of research on pancreatic cancer. And the second one is because pancreatic cancer is usually detected too late. Actually, prognosis of pancreatic cancer depends directly on a stage of diagnosis. If we find uh, pancreatic cancer in a localized stage, meaning that cancer has not spread outside the organ, a 30% uh, chance of surviving um, as for the patient. However, this completely drops to a 3% survival rate if pancreatic cancer is found in a distant stage, meaning that cancer has spread to distant organs such as the brain or the lungs. And 52% of pancreatic cancers are found at this stage. So we are diagnosis pancreatic cancer too late. And early detection saves lives, means the difference between life and death. So probably improving survival in patients with pancreatic cancer may require in-depth research on multiple aspects, such as diagnosis, uh, monitoring of patients, treatments, and so on. And this probably will include research on artificial intelligence in pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer uh, publications related to artificial intelligence, you can see that are very low, quite small compared to other organs. However, we can see this trend increasing in the last uh, years. This is exponentially. Uh, so probably with uh, re more research uh, in artificial intelligence, in radiomics, in machine learning, biomarkers can help improve these uh, pancreatic uh, cancer outcomes. So why it is so important? What we validated at the beginning as a company and why we decided to, be to develop a product trying to identify lesions in the pancreas. First, because it's, there's a high uh, prevalence of precursor lesions in the upper abdomen. One in over two people has a lesion in the upper abdomen that may become cancer in the future. So meaning that half of this class present this, uh, these lesions, even in the pancreas, in the liver, or in the kidneys. Then we have many biopsies with false positive. We are opening people, we are um, doing invasive tests to people that at the end had benign lesions, were not malignant at all. There's also a risk of un undetected cancer in the abdomen. If we do not identify lesions at early stage, these lesions may become malignant in the future. And we can also reduce unnecessary follow-up tests. Now, what is happening in the clinical practice is that if you are found with, an, uh, with a pancreatic lesion, a completely benign pancreatic lesion, as we don't know uh, the, the, the evolution of this particular lesion, we are going to follow up you yearly, going to the hospital, taking you a CT scan on, on MRI just to follow up the lesion. And this can last forever. The challenge is that there's an absence, a complete absence of a screening methods. We are, it's not a, like the, the breast screening cancer that women um, over an age 
go to the doctor and um, do a, 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 a mammography just to check if a nodule uh, has appeared. In the abdomen, there's a complete absence of, of these screening methods. There are uh, diverse management in guidelines. There are several guidelines related to these, these lesions, and every guideline is saying different thing. There's an increased morbidity. If you touch the pancreas, if you do a biopsy in the pancreas, if you do a fine needle aspiration in the pancreas, the patient probably will develop a pancreatitis. So it's a very complicated organ. There's this potential malignancy in benign lesions, lesions that today are benign, but can become malignant in the future. And this, uh, there's a uh, very complex identification and classification of these lesions at the very beginning. So we identified the challenge, we identified the problem, and then we identified also a problem in radiology, particularly in radiology. Why AI in radiology? First, because most radiology departments are short, shortfall, and up to 50% of radiology uh, are lacking in some hospitals. So there's a lack of radiologists in our hospitals, particularly in Spain, but worldwide. Uh, and training of radiologists lasts for four years in Spain. So uh, there's a need of more radiologists to, to tackle uh, or to, to analyze all images that are uh, undertaken today. Also, this, of course, has a direct impact on, on the systems capacity of our hospitals. And why that? Because in the last decade, the number of images produced by a scan has increased five times. However, the number of radiologists has not increased at all. Almost 50% of radiologists uh, declare or report signs of burnout. And taking into account more or less between three and five diagnostic errors uh, in medical imaging, um, we are accounting for 40 million diagnostic errors every year worldwide involving medical imaging. So there's a huge potential of improving this uh, performance, this diagnostic performance in radiology. And what's happening now? What's the picture today of AI in radiology? This is a scientific publication uh, that analyzed 100 CE mark products. CE mark meaning that um, they are certified, they can sell the product uh, from 54 different vendors. And you will realize that there's a lack of science behind. For 64 uh, products, peer review evidence was lacking completely. Uh, the evidence of the remaining um, focus only on diagnostic accuracy. And only 18 AI products demonstrated potential clinical impact. So we are um, launching to the market products that are not correctly scientific validate, validated. And if we focus specifically on different anatomical regions, we can see that, for instance, in breast, many companies are trying to detect nodules in a, 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 for bre breast cancer. However, in the abdomen, only four companies were founded. Well, these ones are Siemens, uh, big, big corporates, but other ones were founded to tackle a specific problem in the abdomen. So these AI companies tackling problems in the abdomen represents only 4% of all AI companies that apply uh, to medical imaging. Why? Because the abdomen is super difficult to analyze because of the heterogeneity of the region, because of the heterogeneity in density of organs, and also because of the heterogeneity of intrapersonal along your life. Your pancreas is not the same today that in 20 years uh, in terms of imaging. So it's a very difficult uh, anatomical area. So taking into account this problem, we have the lack of early diagnosis of cancer in the abdomen, 
there's a lack of radiologists in our hospitals, we develop CKI Medical, the only non-invasive screening algorithm that anticipates pancreatic, hepatic, and renal cancer by identifying focal lesions, following up those lesions, and predicting the evolution of those lesions from the very beginning. We are trying to detect precancerous lesions, benign lesions, before the appearance of cancer, and identify those that, become, that may become malignant in the future. It's an AI medical-driven algorithm that analyzes all CT scans and identifies premalignant lesions. Very importantly, it also follow up the evolution, follows up the, the evolution of the lesion, taking all previous records of the patient and predicts the evolution of those. It's completely non-invasive, it's a medical imaging test, and is fully automated and integrated in the workflow of radiologists. It's a zero-click approach, meaning that uh, an image is taken, software analyzes the image, the image, and when the radiologist opens the, ca the case, this is already analyzed by CKI. Then a report is shown to the radiologist with all information where the lesion was found, uh, the comparison of previous tests, with uh, also ferreting what are some features of those uh, specific lesions, uh, size of the lesion, uh, volume of the lesion, and other signs that are described in the clinical guidelines. So uh, I, what I was saying before, patient arrives to the hospital, the imaging test is performed, the algorithm automatically uh, is triggered and ana analyzes all abdominal CT scans. When the radiologist analyzes the image, is already analyzed by CKI. So we are avoiding this second reader opinion. We are a first reader um, AI algorithm. And we are time aware AI. We have trained the algorithm with thousands of follow-up patients with the evolution of these lesions a long time, and um, now we are able to say from the very beginning how a lesion will evolve thanks to this um, AI-aware, a time-aware algorithm. Um, in terms of product deployment, um, well, uh, it's important to say that we are, do we are using deep convolutional neural networks. Um, we, identify, um, we identify the face. Uh, CT scan has many faces. You need to identify the face that you are going to, to process. Uh, then you do this image quality assessment. We discard uh, incorrect protocols. And then we have uh, patented our, um, our uh, approach of diagnosis lesions. Uh, and then we apply this unique lesion co-registration algorithm that we are also patenting now. So we are able to identify a lesion in this study that was already present in this study uh, before. So this is very important for radiologists because they waste a lot of time comparing CTs just to see if the lesion has evolved in, in size or even in, in several worries and futures present in, in the city. Um, but turning your product into a marketed medical device is not easy and has many barriers. The most important barrier that we find when we develop a medical device is the regulatory pathway. Um, this is uh, since 2000, 2017, or I would say 2021, because it took some time to implement. We have this medical device regulation in Europe, and all manufacturers of medical device need to, um, uh, we need to follow this, this, this regulation. We also need to be certified in ISO, and a notified body, body who is an external um, company which is going to audit your product and your process. There's all, all, um, also another barrier, which is the integration and adoption. Um, you need to do a plug and play product, something that is quite easy for the radiology that is not going to give uh, him or her more work to do. 
needs to be seamlessly integrated in, in his or her workflow. And this is just a very simple way of explaining you uh, the, the path you need to follow if you want to, um, uh, to bring your medical device to market in Europe. We have this C mark um, need. So we, you need first to do the C mark strategic plan. When you found uh, a company, you even don't know what's a C mark. So it's difficult to, to establish a strategic plan of a C mark. So I recommend from the very beginning to contact a regulatory company that can help you a bit with this strategic plan. From the very beginning, even if you don't have the product. Then you need to define the intended use and product classification. The intended use is what's the software doing, uh, what is intended for, in our case, is intended to detect and classify precursor lesions in the upper abdomen in CT scans and is uh, only used by radiologists. Uh, product classification goes through 1 to A to B and 3, and uh, it's according to the risk for the patient. Just to give you an example, we are a medical device software categorized as 2B. It's just a software, it's just an opinion-based software for the radiologist, but even we are a software classified as 2B because the notified body considered that we had, um, uh, that the, had a risk for the patient. You need to establish the quality management system and the conformity with essential requirements. The quality management system is based on the ISO. And then uh, you need to start the procedure and what is going to kill you or what can kill your startup is the technical documentation. We have thousands and thousands of documents with all the product specification explaining the traceability, the requirements, explain every step that we have done since the very beginning to demonstrate clinical evaluation, to demonstrate that our software is safe and to demonstrate that our software can be implemented in, in hospital. Thousands and thousands of documents. Then you apply to a notified body, if applicable. If you are a class, class one, you don't need to, uh, a, a notified body, but if you are a class two or three, a notified body will need to audit everything. And if you go yes from the notified body, you then get the approval, approval and uh, you get this C mark, which is the conformity, conformity European mark. Um, then, of course, you need to clinically and technically uh, demonstrate the feasibility. We have performed several clinical trials. We are engaged uh, uh, with eight major hospitals in Spain and Germany, developing uh, this clinical evaluation. Um, and we, achieve, we have achieved uh, 96 sensitivity and 88 specificity uh, for now. Um, we have also patented our um, method uh, diagnosis approach, and we have proved as a plug and play product to be integrated directly in, in, in hospitals. Um, just to finish, we have also identified our business model. Uh, our clients are healthcare uh, centers and clinics, uh, pharmaceutical companies. So this is a, a B2B company, it's business to business. It's not the same as a B2C business to customer that I cannot sell my product to you. My product is only be used by uh, hospitals or pharmaceutical companies. And um, of course, we have a, a committed team uh, helping us develop the product. Uh, we have Sara Toledano, is the CEO of the company. He's an MBA, industrial engineer. Javier Garcia, he holds a PhD in, in computer vision. He's also an engineer. And myself, a PhD in biomedicine. So we are a team of three co-founders, very complementary. And as you can see here, we have a very young committed team helping us. Some of uh, UPF uh, former students that started with us doing an internship and then we got them 
at the company. You can see that we divided, sorry, we divided the team in management, scientific quality, quality and regulatory, front end and integration, and uh, AI development um, in, the, in the company. These are our medical and business advisors. It's very important to get them. Um, we have Dr. Manel Escobar, the chief of uh, medical imaging of Valdebron, who joined, joined us. And it's very important to uh, get involved with these key opinion leaders or advisors that can help um, develop your product. And of course, I would say that thank you and please join us. We will be very happy to, to get you at SIGAIP.